All right. Hello, everybody. Let's go ahead and let's get started. So hello, everybody. Welcome to the Commanding Tech Challenge webinar. So today we'll be covering a few things, and I'll start by giving everyone an introduction to freelancer.com. From there, the NIST team will give us the challenge background, as well as more information about the requested outcomes and about instant command approaches. We'll then share a video discussion of Scott Ledgerwood and Chief Sterling Folden, where Chief Holden will share his experience with instant command dashboards. LMI will follow that and share some more technical background of this challenge and what is to be expected before I will walk everyone through the challenge schedule, the challenge prizes, how to participate and how to submit an entry into this challenge and also discuss eligibility. Then we'll close off with some live Q&A from there. Now, a couple of things before we start, uh, note that this call is being recorded and the recording will be made available through the challenge page and sent to everyone who has registered in, for this webinar. Uh, please use the Q&A panel today for any questions that we have. We have a dedicated portion of this webinar for your questions, so make sure you use that. And please use the Q&A panel instead of chat for all your questions. Lastly, if we can't get to your questions today, we'll make sure to answer them through an FAQs document that will be attached to the challenge page. Before we get started, I want to quickly introduce myself and the speakers today. So first of all, my name is David and I work on the freelancer.com enterprise team and I'll be your host for today. From this, we have Sarah Hughes and Scott Ledgerwood who will be taking us through the challenge background and requested outcomes. Garrett Gibson from LMI who will share the technical aspects of the challenge. And finally, Chief Sterling Folden, who will be sharing his experience in a video discussion with Scott. Really quick, I want to kick things off with a little bit about freelancer.com. So this challenge is being hosted on freelancer.com, which means that you will have to go through the freelancer.com platform to enter into this challenge. So what is freelancer.com? Well, freelancer.com is the world's largest freelancing and crowdsourcing marketplace by number of users and by number of jobs posted. And to date, we have over 56 million users globally and over $4.5 billion in jobs posted. Now, when we talk about connecting users globally, we truly mean it. And so here's a map of our users plotted in white on a black canvas. Pink is where work is being posted and blue is, work, is where work is being done. And so we really connect uh, users globally here. Now, Free Answers Challenge Platform specifically is what we'll be discussing today. So Free Answers Challenge Platform allows participants from all over the world to submit entries that a challenge holder can then choose from. And to date, there have been over 1.5 million challenges posted and millions of dollars paid out in prizes. But enough about freeanswer.com. Let's talk about the specifics of the challenge. And so as discussed earlier, we have Sarah Scott and Chief Holden here to tell us a little bit more about the challenge. But first, a quick introduction to them. So Sarah Hughes serves as a prize competition and challenge specialist with NIST Public Safety Communications Research, PSCR Division's Open Innovation Team. In this role, she manages internal and external R&D, communications, legal, administrative, and procurement resources to design and implement prize competitions and challenges to advance PSCR's mission. Sarah and the NIST Open Innovation Team recently received their agency's 2021 George A. Uriano Award in recognition for their outstanding leadership delivering public-private partnerships that drove the research and development of critical life-saving communications capabilities for first responders. Scott Ledgerwood leads the user interface user experience portfolio at NIST Public Safety Communications Research, where he is focused on improving usability and user interface testing for first responders. His team is developing new test methodologies, leveraging virtual and augmented reality to enable improved research, testing, development of first responder technologies. And lastly, Chief Sterling Folden has been serving in the Boulder County for area for over 30 years and has been Deputy Fire Chief for over 18 years. His service began at the Cherryvale Fire Protection District, climbing through the ranks from firefighter to deputy chief. He has experienced many aspects of the fire service from emergency operations to prevention and administration. Chief Folden is a graduate of University of Denver and holds a Master of Organizational Leadership, focusing on innovation and change, along with a graduate certificate in organizational development. He completed his Bachelor's of Fire and Emergency Services Administration at Metropolitan State University and has his chief fire officer designation from the Center for Public Safety Excellence. Scott, uh, Sarah, Scott, Chief Folden, over to you guys. 
Thank you, David, for that introduction. Uh, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Really excited to be sharing with you uh, the Commanding Tech Challenge. Uh, first, I wanted to provide a little bit of background on this PSCR. Um, so we are a Public Safety Communications Research Division. Um, we fall under the National Institute of Standards and Technology, one of the nation's lab, well known for keeping the nation's time. Uh, and we fall under the Department of Commerce. Um, our sister agency is FirstNet Authority, and they're really charged with kind of overseeing this deployment of a nationwide public safety broadband network. And so we interact with them quite regularly and support a lot of kind of that future R&D activities that take place to support that uh, national public safety broadband network. NIST is our <laughs> PSER has actually been around um, for quite some time. Um, just after 9-11, uh, where there were a lot of radio interoperability issues identified um, across uh, municipalities, across disciplines, um, we stepped in and, and helped um, support a lot of the early R&D to help address those issues. Um, later in the early 2000s, uh, we did a lot of work in improving speech intelligibility, um, working on vocoders for land mobile radio systems. Uh, and then in 2012, uh, the legislation that created the FirstNet Authority really helped uh, solidify uh, a lot of our work and kind of looking down the road, you know, five to 10 years out on what is possible uh, now that first responders will have access to a broadband network where they'll have things like data and, and maps and, and technologies that were, um, you know, accessible to the commercial industry and, and probably even, you know, our kids, um, but um, not necessarily deployed a widespread across the, the first responder community. And so again, a lot of our research was focused in kind of that arena and what that technology brings to the table for our first responders. So going back to 2012, there was the Middle Class Relief and Job Creation Act um, that's created the FirstNet uh, Authority entity uh, and provided them with $6 billion to build out this, uh, this network. Uh, it also gave NIST $300 million to uh, focus specifically on, on kind of the R&D mission for public safety communication technology systems. Within that legislation, a few things were called out like mission critical voice to LMR um, and LMR to LTE uh, interoperability. Um, but beyond that, it allowed us to kind of identify other key research areas that we could have the biggest impact on. And so we pulled together stakeholder meetings, summits, uh, road mapping sessions, and, and brought together industry, academia, and public safety to kind of really identify what are these key areas that we want to invest in over this uh, next 10 year period. And I'll touch on those research areas in a few. Um, and then uh, we also stood up this open innovation program because we realized um, this legislation provided that funding, but also gave it an earmark of 10 years for execution. So it actually sunsets towards the end of this year. And so we wanted to be able to really leverage, um, you know, innovative thinkers and, and collaborators from around the world that can help us um, to uh, achieve this mission and, and really move the needle in these respective areas. And so uh, not only do we work across other federal agencies, um, we uh, and across the different laboratories at NIST, um, you know, Information Technology Laboratory, the National Center of Cybersecurity of Excellence. Um, we also uh, leverage prize challenges and grants and, and cooperative agreements across industry and academia um, that can help us kind of focus on these respective areas. And I think over the, the period of time that we've had that $300 million, nearly 100 million of that has gone out to grants to support these different research areas that we're focused on. Uh, and several million has gone out to, um, to prize challenge awardees, um, helping us support these different um, innovation challenges that we put out there. So I won't go into all the research areas for the, the sake of time today, um, but I did wanna call out that this is kind of a cross uh, initiative uh, challenge. And so while the main focus is on kind of improving that overall user interface user experience for these instant command dashboards, um, we also wanted to bring in some of the kind of the factual technologies and, and great research outputs coming out of our adjacent uh, areas, such as location-based services and public safety analytics. Um, and so in the UI UX field, again, uh, we're really focused on improving that interaction between the end user, the, the first responder in this case, and the technology system that they're using. Uh, and we do that through better understanding kind of the, the context of use of these technologies, the, the problems and needs of the first responder community, but then also looking at future technologies um, that we can use to prototype some of these enhanced user interfaces like heads up displays, haptics, uh, vocal commands or, or uh, audio cues for interaction. On the location-based services front, 
Um, we're really focused on improving pre-planning, um, mapping, um, and we'll talk about kind of the LIDARs and, and 3D visualizations that we can leverage um, to support this challenge. Indoor tracking down to a sub one meter accuracy, uh, including the Z-axis, so you know, you know what floor a first responder is in when they're um, responding to a scene. And then piecing that information together and providing uh, navigation information either to that end user or to that incident commander helping with that response. And then public safety analytics, which really looks at data analytics across the board, including social media streams, but for the sake of this challenge, really delving deep into kind of video analytics and, and what that brings to the table to help that, that first responder kind of um, make the, the best use of information readily available to them uh, in support of their response. And so UI UX uh, portfolio is no stranger to uh, challenges. Um, I'm happy to say I've been working with Sarah for you know, the past five plus years um, in, in running these initiatives. And, and um, I think with great success, um, we've had some really great valuable outputs of, of each of these activities and have been able to build over the years and, and integrate lessons learned and, and kind of uh, continue to push the needle uh, in this respective domain. So we started back in 2017, um, looking at um, you know, what could be done leveraging a technology like VR to support the public safety mission uh, and, and R&D around communication technology systems. Um, we hosted our first challenge on a VR platform uh, in 2018, looking at uh, if you had all of the location-based information available to you, uh, mapping, uh, objective location, location of your first responders, location of victims, et cetera, how do you um, aggregate all that, analyze it, and then convey that to an end user through a heads-up display um, to help them um, respond to a, an incident? Uh, 2019, we looked at haptic interfaces, again, leveraging a VR platform, but then taking um, the feedback from our judging panel, allowing the finalists to iterate on the design and actually embed it into firefighter PPE and test it under a uh, realistic conditions at a, a firefighter uh, training center. 2020 was a large tech to protect uh, challenge consisting of 10 contests running the gamut of uh, all research areas at PSCR, but with three focused in on UI UX. And then Chariot Challenge um, was our large scale augmented reality challenge that had a very strong incident command um, piece to it, but really focused on kind of convey that information through a, a visual heads up display, in this case, an augmented reality headset. And then recently, we also looked uh, at building up the research capacity around video analytics and, and video image and quality improvements by building out data sets and, and um, deploying various algorithms to those systems. And so I just wanted to touch on the most recent um, AR challenge, Chariot, um, which was Challenge Augmented Reality Internet of Things, because I think this one is the, the one that directly relates um, to um, kind of where we are with the Commanding Tech Challenge and incorporates a lot of those lessons learned. And so Chariot was um, all around tapping into the smart city, smart building, personal area network uh, information of the world um, and seeing how a user could enable a first responder to, to take action on that information, to, um, to leverage that data coming in to support them in a, in a series of tasks. Um, and those were deployed over four different incidents, an active shooter, a wildfire, a mass transit accident, which was a, a seven car Amtrak pileup, and a flood. And so in each one of these scenarios, we had all this data coming out about particulates, hazards, uh, location of first responders, location of, of victims in the area. Uh, and these interfaces had to be developed that they could tap into the information in an intuitive format. And so it was really great. We had 11 uh, finalists come out to the, to the final event where we were able to test their prototypes with our judging panel and active first responders. Uh, and you know, one of the, the main takeaways that we got from that was you know, from the active first responders that they had just a fraction of this information, what a game changer it would be in the response. And so that was really heartening um, you know, to, to know that we're kind of on the right track and, and we're trying to get that right information out to our, our end users. Um, now, one of the downsides with, with Chariot is you know, we're looking at technology that's probably gonna be you know, another few years before it's readily deployed out to the field. Um, and so the AR comes with limitations with today's um, units that are available, um, but we know we want this information to get out there to the first responder community. And so that led us to build off that for the commanding tech challenge where we can keep it an open platform. Maybe we still have entrance coming in in the VR AR lane, um, but definitely looking at um, anything that's nearly mobile, uh, mobile or deployable in nature. So your, uh, your tablets, your mobile devices, your web browsers, things like that build off the, the capacity of providing this data and these intuitive user interfaces, but not limiting it to a certain hardware platform. So with that, I'll hand it over to Sarah to talk a little bit more about the challenge. Thank you, Scott.
so taking those lessons learned, we're so excited to, to launch the Commanding Tech Challenge with our implementation partners at freelancer.com and LMI. And some of the key aspects that we're excited to talk to you about the challenge will be found on the next slide where we were really focused on taking some of those lessons learned. Uh, the first one is public, or partnering with public safety. So you as innovators will either kind of apply directly with a public safety partner, if you already have one, or we'll be in the, uh, take the process of matching you uh, with a public safety partner, really making sure that you understand the use case and are directly connected with the users that would someday use your technology. Also, as you heard from Scott, we are so excited that two of our uh, grant uh, entities are, are sharing their research and development efforts and providing that open source to try to help you um, advance your dashboards. And that's an in indoor localization. Um, so the dashboards will be, you'll have access to kind of LIDAR scans uh, from the phase three and the phase four event, uh, indoor tracking and sensor um, sensors. And so we're really excited to kind of see how this data will really advance incident command dashboards in the indoor local localization and indoor tracking space. The other aspect is video analytics. Um, we'll kind of see in a few slides later us talk more about kind of the excitement that, that we've seen from some of our uh, external partners and their research and development efforts with public safety. Um, and we're excited to have that as a component of this challenge. All of your uh, technology will also be been, uh, have the opportunity to be undergo a rigorous testing and evaluation at the Department of Commerce Laboratory in Boulder, Colorado, as part of phase three. And at phase four, we're really excited to have kind of you as the innovators, the final four um, contestants will have the opportunity to provide a technology demonstration from their perspective uh, with access to kind of a live and stage event, a multi-story building with actors and really kind of take the time to showcase your capabilities. You'll hear soon from Chief Folden, uh, kind of sharing some of their experience. Um, but this challenge really focuses in on the first few hours of incident command. We know there's a lot of really great technology in the, um, in the space, but most of it's really designed uh, and a lot of it is used kind of by big uh, emergency operation centers, kind of as full hours after an incident has already um, taken fold. And so you'll hear kind of the importance um, and the resources of why we need some kind of technology to focus in on that first few hours to help them understand and track and scale as the incident scales themselves. So currently, these are kind of some of the methods that Chief Fulton had shared that he's seen across his experience and that's kind of used across uh, the United States. So we're really excited to see what comes out of this challenge and if there's any tools or technology that will be helpful for first responders in that initial response phase. Our partners at First Responder Network Authority were really excited to participate in this challenge and also wanted to share some of the experience they've had on connecting and communicating with public safety. So at first, they really wanted to make clear that the importance is let responders be responders. Technology can augment or supplement their capabilities, but really should never distract. Their job is to save lives. And that's kind of a key component when you're speaking with your public safety partner of how would this technology augment, but not distract from their initial response. The other aspects to think through with their technology is it really needs to be trusted. Um, that's why a lot of them go back to kind of grease uh, markers on windows or paper and pencil because they know it will work every single time. So that's kind of a key component to think through in your kind of prototype and development is how are you going to make sure this is a resilient uh, technology kind of at, at the end stage of its product. The other aspect is simplicity. Think about where they work. Um, as you, as uh, Chief Folden will kind of share, you'll, you'll have responses at 2 a.m. in the morning and also in the middle of a blizzard. And the same technology they use for each response needs to work through all those scenarios. The other aspect is ex it needs to expand. So sometimes the initial response um, they, they have kind of a good control and then something will happen and all of a sudden the response scales in a matter of minutes and they need a dashboard that can reflect that. The same aspect is connectivity. While our partners at First Responder Network Authority and FirstNet work to kind of expand techno technology and connectivity across the United States, uh, this dashboard and their tools really need to work kind of in, in the middle of the incident or on the top of a mountain where maybe connectivity is repaired because of the emergency scenario. 
And last is situational awareness. We'll talk a lot about the incident commander really wants to get information from the field, but also to be to relay that information to the people on the field to make sure that kind of there's a two way direction in communication. And on the next slide. We're excited to kind of share more about that public safety scenario. And so Scott's going to take us through a little bit of the important aspects and then where to find this information. Yeah, and um, thanks, Sarah. And I think one of the things I, I want to highlight is, you know, we've We've done our market research in advance of this challenge. You know, we were looking to see what capabilities exist out there from an incident command dashboard today. Uh, around that same time, uh, DHS also produced a report kind of conducting similar market research around incident command um, technology systems available. Um, and, and we definitely didn't want to reinvent the world, uh, the, um, the wheel here. Um, and so we, we crafted this challenge to really highlight these aspects of these technology areas that, that we talked about, the, the LIDAR scans, the, the 3D uh, building information through the point clouds, uh, the indoor tracking capabilities of, of incorporating that XYZ access for your first responders moving about the facility, and then also these video analytics streams. And so while we looked at um, kind of the, the marketplace and what's available, we saw a lot of these technology systems really excelled um, pulling in GIS information and kind of these larger outdoor incidents that are underway. Um, but, but few were able to really support this indoor visualization and integrate all these different components for supporting um, that, that in-building incident response. And so we crafted out these emergency scenarios for phase three and phase four, where you will be able to kind of make best use of that data, that LIDAR scan, that 3D point cloud scan, and these other uh, data points and, and sensors that are coming into play to support this challenge. And so at the, the link here, you can go out and you can read more about the emergency scenarios and how uh, they unfold and kind of the different sensors and technologies that we're seeking to integrate that we're hopeful that will be integrated into these incident command dashboards. Um, and again, you know, while we're leaning on these kind of adjacent technology areas to, to really kind of highlight the, the potential impact of these, um, these technology systems, um, we also want to stress the importance of that UI UX flow, right? That, that general usability of this uh, dashboard for the end user. And so, um, you know, we wanna make sure people aren't just uh, not only bringing in these uh, information feeds that can be that uh, impactful, but really presenting that information in an intuitive and useful way to that first responder. So as Scott mentioned, we're really excited to kind of um, share two of our uh, external funded partners um, and their research and development efforts. So from the University of Memphis, you will have access to the LIDAR scans kind of in phase three from one of their um, big auditorium space. As you saw from the public safety scenario, this scenario is all about kind of a, a planned controversial speaker. Um, and so we'll put, have kind of the floor map set up um, and also the LIDAR scans of this building that have been annotated. We're also very excited that University of Memphis as a challenge partner will be the site location for phase four. So the contestants that, that make it to the final phase will actually be doing a demonstration in the facility with the, the access to their LIDAR scans. And with the video analytics partner from the University of Houston, we were really excited about their efforts that they've been working hand in hand with the, the public safety department at, uh, at the city of Houston. And some of the aspects that they've been really thinking through is um, currently some first responders have access to kind of a video surveillance aspect, but that really doesn't help them um, beyond kind of it, unless someone is monitoring 24 seven of looking kind of at the different videos. So instead the University of Houston has been thinking through a public safety of how different analytical structures would really help highlight kind of when there's a change or when there's a notification to really help uh, first responders make best use of, of any kind of video structures that they may have. And on the next slide, you'll kind of see these are the same or key areas that when they've been working hand in hand with public safety of the topic areas that they've seen that first responders might be excited about uh, of seeing kind of video analytics progress. And several of these topics you'll hear more from our partners at LMI will be part of this challenge and provided to you to utilize and integrate into your dashboards. But before we uh, go to that component, we really wanted to clarify, um, oops, so sorry, uh, the next slide, what we are looking for in contestants dashboards. So as part of kind of the challenge in each phase, we're excited to see your progress. So maybe it's a brand new dashboard that you're proposing at phase one in the concept level, or you already have a pre-existing dashboard that you're excited to integrate indoor localization and video analytics into the structure. 
And so you'll be kind of reporting in on your progress at each phase of the way. And these are the key components that we're really excited about to see integrated into your dashboards. So again, um, stay tuned to all the great information that's on the freelancer.com challenge website and all the resources that are there for you. Now we're really excited to kind of introduce and play a video of Chief Folden and Scott Ledgerwood, uh, who will kind of share more about their experience in Incident Command. Welcome, my name is Scott Ledgerwood. I'm the User Interface User Experience Portfolio Lead at Public Safety Communications Research Division. I'm joined here with Chief Sterling Folding from Mountain View Fire Rescue based in Longmont, Colorado. Uh, really excited to have the Chief join me today as we have a brief discussion about Incident Command Response and how communication technology systems are leveraged today. So, thank you, Chief. Yeah, thank you for having me. So first question I want to throw at you is um, a bit of a hypothetical. Let's say your first do on scene, um, multi-story structure fire. What are some of the key things that you look out for and what tools or systems do you leverage today, if any? Uh, so the job really begins on the way to the call. Uh, as, as we're arriving, we're looking at access, uh, we're looking at water supply, staging areas, things like that. The commander starts to think about those things. Um, and as we're arriving at the building, we look at building type, building function. Is this a school, a hospital, assisted living? Is it a, is it a apartment building? Um, and then we look at building construction to see what it's made out of. And then we're also looking to see if we can see flames, smoke, where that might be coming from, what side of the building. Uh, and then we also start to look for uh, any built-in fire safety systems, sprinklers, alarms, things like that. Are they activating? Are they working? Is the building evacuated? And then along with that, we also want to be able to find and utilize building uh, utilities like gas, power, water, uh, those types of things that we uh, need to assign people to to control and help with the situation. So those are all things to do that. If we use anything today, we use any, we, we kind of use a, a whole range of products, anything from a notepad of paper, which some people still like, um, as scary as that could be. Uh, whiteboard is very common. Um, and then on the other far end, some people are using a tablet style with an electronic program that they can track some age, uh, apparatus or assignments with that way as well. Excellent. Um, the Marshall Fire occurred last year in Boulder, Colorado, a really devastating event, impacting over a thousand homes, and you were part of the response for that. So as we look at a, an event of that magnitude that's got an extended duration, many hours, up to many days, right? How does that change your response uh, especially when we're talking about multiple disciplines, multiple jurisdictions coming in to support that activity. So a fire like the Marshall Fire is kind of, you know, once in a career thing, but uh, they seem to be becoming more and more common in people's careers. So uh, the problem is it, it grows exponentially over a period of hours. And so it's difficult to keep that up and everything gets overwhelmed. Uh, voice communications gets overwhelmed, incident command gets overwhelmed, response systems, dispatch centers, uh, auto and mutual aid systems also start to become overwhelmed and taxed. Um, and that's just in the first few hours. And this duration, you know, we went for a, several days before it helped snowed, and even that didn't bring the incident mm -hmm. to an end. So um, we kind of get into a system there where after a few hours, we can get a, a local incident management team that can help break up some different uh, aspects of the fire and help with that. And then as we got into a few days, we brought in a national incident management teams that comes with dozens and dozens of people uh, to our incident. Sometimes they come with hundreds um, that can really break it out and support the incident. But we're trying to fill that initial gap of a few hours, um, which becomes very difficult and it becomes overwhelmed very quickly, especially for incident command when you have, uh, you know, four, five, dozen, um, we had 155 agencies respond. Now they didn't respond within the first few hours, but over the course of the duration, there was 155 agencies. For those first few hours, we had dozens and dozens of agencies and you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of apparatus. And we just, it's very hard to track and keep and control yeah. that stuff, so. Yeah, and um, the commanding tech challenge is, is really trying to fill that niche, right? That first on scene, uh, first couple hours of the incident, providing the tools that could help support that response. So just pulling that thread a little bit more, um, as the event prolongs, um, obviously fatigue and stress start to set in, um, and we have kind of this increase in complexity, while at the same time you have this constant stream of information coming from different sources, different types of data. Uh, for a contestant that's entering the commanding tech challenge, what are some suggestions that you would give them to um, kind of best make use of that data and make sure that they're providing something to you in an actionable format? Yeah. So if we remember we're trying to fill that gap, that first few hours of an incident until we can really determine whether we're going to 
uh, move into another operational period or if we're going to de-escalate this incident and, and what do we do from there, right? Um, so some things that are, are helpful is you are getting all sorts of input from uh, radios uh, in person, face to face, from the visual out, out from outside the windshield, uh, all sorts of inputs, phone calls, things like that that are going on. Um, so for me, I always find myself needing a parking lot where I can park all this input and then um, I don't have anything, but if it could remind me that I parked something in the parking lot and I need to address it at some point, that would be great. You know, urgent, not urgent, something like that. And then benchmarks as well to make sure I've hit the key kind of uh, categories that need to be taken care of. Uh, you know, for a structure fire, have, uh, have we done a search and have we evaluated the roof and uh, have we established a water supply and have we controlled utilities, things like that for, for a structure fire would be great. Um, and then things like, you know, uh, aerial photography or pre-plans that are put into that, um, things where I can pull up something from the building and look to see what the systems are in it. Uh, those are all very helpful. Um, something that tracks crews, their assignments, uh, how long they've been there would be really helpful as well. A lot of times we rely on the crew's feedback to us of if they're tired or not, and we're firefighters, so we want to say that we never get tired, right? We never need to go to rehab. But I have to track those times of those people and, and, and make them go uh, take a break. Mm -hmm. So all those things would be great. And then while we're filling that gap, we're, it's got to either cons be able to expand or compress with the incident. Um, and it may need to expand into a next operational period where I'm going to hand that off to someone that's coming in. And it needs to make logical sense to that person. Um, or it needs to be able to de-escalate with the incident as well. Um, as I kind of spool down an incident and I send resources home, it starts to shrink with me. It just doesn't stop once I get to a point. Yeah. Very insightful. So definitely have some flexibilities there yeah. for the response. Yeah. Um, so the last question I have for you is um, part of the commanding tech challenge is to look across the uh, different research areas that we're focused on from um, analytics to location-based services. And so we'll definitely be pulling in some factual technologies like video analytics streams. We'll have uh, the ability to track the location of your colleagues across multiple stories, uh, the ability to visualize the interior of a structure uh, as well as some IoT tracking capabilities like occupancy sensors or the ability to detect um, hazardous materials in the space. So if a contestant is successful in integrating all those um, data points into a, a dashboard, um, how does that impact your ability to respond and, and what does that mean for you really at the end of the day? Yeah, I, I mean at the end of the day it, it, it has a massive impact because the more situational awareness I have, and the, the better ability I have to look at the incident as a whole, um, I can make a better judgment. And so I can right size my response. Um, it helps me plan for an hour down the road or a next operational period down the road if I'm having accurate information given back to me. Um, otherwise, it's a lot of times it's like playing that phone game where someone on the radio inside is describing what they see to me or what I hear from, uh, from the crews inside. And then I'm interpreting that as well. And I'm, I'm trying to make this judgment call, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the more hard data I can get and put it and wrap it together, the better judgments I can make and the better planning I can do. Um, do I need to step this response up? Do I need to step this response down? Do I need to plan for a long duration? Or is this going to be shorter, two hours where I can get my arms around this? Um, all those things are a big, big help. And then, um, yeah, being able to go back and look through that stuff. And so when I'm writing a report or we're trying to break apart the instance, see what went well or the opportunities for improvement, if we can use this system to kind of pull out those benchmarks or those notes that happened and then uh, reconstruct the incident for better opportunities in the future as well. Right. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you again for your time today. Yeah. Greatly appreciate course. it. And hopefully this information and your expertise and lessons learned that you shared um, will be very impactful for our contestant teams moving forward. Great. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to participate. Thanks. Awesome. So next up, we have Garrett Gibson from LMI, who will be giving us some of the more technical background of this challenge and what is expected of our participants. And so a little bit about Garrick. So Garrick is a consultant at LMI with the background in software engineering. His area of expertise includes full stack web development, web application development, UI, UX design, and Internet of Things. Having filled the role of technical lead on several development and research products for groups such as the DLA, the USN, the USA, and USAF, he currently serves NIST Public Safety Communications Research as a technical subject matter expert for the Command Tech Challenge. So Garrick, over to you. Thanks, David. Perfect. So first of all, uh, who is LMI? So we are a federal consultancy that was established 60 years ago underneath the Kennedy administration to solve some of the government's toughest problems. 
In that time, we've conducted more than 5,000 studies and analyses to support major decisions and investments. And uh, next slide, please. So what is our area of expertise? Uh, what is represented by the LMI team members that are part of this challenge? In general, we have uh, 2,000 people spread across logistics, management advisories, and various other areas of expertise. But for context, uh, support for this effort uh, comes primarily from LMI's digital and analytic solutions group, uh, particularly uh, areas of digital technologies, uh, that's me, software engineering background, and data science, that's the team that's for the underlying simulation and uh, putting together the, the data points themselves. So, what are we providing for the data, the simulation, and all the above? So it's a hybrid simulation. So it is uh, both synthetic and uh, real device-based feeds. So those data feeds are going to come from sensors throughout the incident space. And ideally, the contestants won't know the difference from what the data they receive from their end, but it will be a combination of the two. Uh, so these incident dashboards will consume these feeds, uh, spawn appropriately descriptive events over a timeline, maybe 10, 15 minutes, with uh, real actors wearing physical devices. For example, the indoor positioning system, uh, we're targeting uh, ultra wide band right now, so it might even be more accurate than the one meter uh, level. Uh, or uh, even synthetic actors who, for example, triage victims, where we wouldn't want to have somebody increase their heart rate or decrease their pulse ox. Um, and then maybe a hybrid uh, solution for the CCTV video streams, where they'll have real analytics uh, that are actually reporting on what you see frame by frame, or maybe something synthetic where we couldn't potentially um, simulate that. Um, our floor plans uh, are gonna be derived and enhanced by LIDAR scans and uh, events that happen within those 3D spaces with the XYZ coordinates will be closely attached to those point cloud city points. So you can um, kind of map to uh, in your 3D space with those. So as far as competition phases go, uh, the competition is split up into four phases. As each phase progresses, the simulation sensor data feeds that contestants have access to are going to mature. So they'll, they'll start off pretty simple, you know, schemas, example feeds, They'll get more detailed. We'll have uh, provided API feeds that'll also mature alongside the schemas and the descriptions of these unique sensors, culminating in uh, the uh, uh, fully matured simulation that'll be available in the phase three and phase four demos. So the next slide, before we get to it, uh, can we go back one second? Uh, it's gonna be an overview of uh, each phase as it relates to sensor data and what we expect from the contestants for each uh, phase. Next, but switch over, please. So uh, we split it up into the four kind of major categories of each phase, expectations, and then the three um, kind of major tenets, tenets of data. We'll start off with uh, expected outputs. So for phase one, all we expect from contestants is a white paper uh, describing your general outlook on what you think you might have to provide with the data we are outlining and um, what your dashboard might look like conceptually. Phase two uh, would be a video demo to, um, to show progress based off of your white paper's original inputs, kind of the prototype phase. Phase three will be a live test of that prototype in an environment with uh, actors and simulated uh, characters, but mostly simulated. And then phase four, the final live demo, will be a little bit of the opposite. It'll be more actors, less simulation, but still quite a bit of simulation. So for the LiDAR scans, initially, um, those will be provided in phase one and phase two for the publicly available uh, NIST, uh, through NIST Point Cloud City initiative. In phase three, uh, we're going to focus on actual spaces. So you'll have a NIST facility mock up uh, academic spaces to a single floor. And then finally, in phase four, for the University of Memphis scans, we're going to expand that conceptually to the multi floor um, maturity that we've been talking about for the indoor positioning um, component of the system. As far as sensor data goes, it's going to be in CSV or JSON format. Uh, for phase one, and this is already available up on our uh, schema challenge repository on box, uh, the data schemas for each unique sensor. We're tracking 12 unique sensors right now. Some of those 12 are unique capabilities of our CCTV analytics feeds, but 12 sensors. Uh, in phase two, those uh, schemas will mature. Uh, we'll give you some more syntax, 
sample readings with valid values, and then culminating towards phase two uh, we'll, so for use in phase three and throughout. We'll have a 10 minute uh, kind of sample development oriented data feed, um, including the uh, indoor positioning systems uh, simulated and then eventually um, actually mailed to contestants. We are, that's one of our physical components we're trying to um, move the ball forward with. Um, once I mentioned the ultra wide band frequency, those devices will actually be sent out to developer teams as kits with a couple anchors, a couple tags that you might set up in your own physical space. Um, finally, in phase three and four, once uh, we actually have those physical kits, either for developers and also in the spaces, the academic spaces previously mentioned, we are going to do the final real time simulation with uh, both synthetic and real sensor feeds combined, along with our CCTV video feed and analytics capabilities. To get into a little bit more detail there, uh, for phase one, we have just the descriptions and the capabilities of the CCTV uh, capability uh, analytics engine. That's also up on our box uh, repository and other documentation we've provided that matures into full API documentation with a sample video loop with uh, analytics over the frames uh, provided by um, the University of Houston accessible externally through API. Once again, development oriented. And then finally matures into the real time video feeds with actual analytics of what you're seeing and simulated analytics for things we might not be able to strictly um, kind of act out with um, our actors in the spaces. So a combination of the two. And you'll also receive the physical orientation and position of the camera so you can identify it within a 3D space or on a LIDAR scan by point. So the sensors themselves, uh, like I said, we have 12 that we're tracking right now, split them up into physical, synthetic, and uh, kind of the CCTV oriented um, sensor feeds. I will start off with the physical, that's the first responder location. So that is our primary physical sensor that we're um, trying to integrate into this challenge uh, as a change from previous challenges. So indoor positioning systems, uh, we're targeting ultra wide band for uh, up to one centimeter actually uh, accuracy, depending on line of sight and quite a few things, but definitely within our one meter um, maximum. And those tags will be worn by first responders uh, with the anchors pre-positioned throughout the spaces in um, known XYZ coordinates or attached to a uh, LiDAR scan point cloud um, points. So the synthetic sensor is what we're simulating, either because it's um, not applicable or realistic to have an actor play out those readings by wearing a wearable, or simply because the sensors themselves are not at a point where we could immediately procure them for this contest, et cetera. First responder vitals. So what you might do with those is uh, individual temperature, heart rate, and pulse ox. How would you respond to those if they change over time? Um, and then segueing into victim vitals and triage, same uh, properties and values for victims, only there'll be several of them, like how, who would you prioritize based off of their readings? Moving into hazard identification and structural hazard identification, the differences there being uh, hazard identification might be particulate, smoke might move, might not. Structural hazard detection, uh, static, uh, something to avoid, like a structural collapse, um, avoid this area, route around it. Um, then we have our AVL systems. So tracking, for example, um, first responder asset vehicles external to the space uh, to simulate it on onboard GPS, basically. Where were the vehicles before the incident? Show us where they are afterwards. Um, and event space ambient temperature monitoring. So uh, consider that uh, the outdoor space. So if, uh, for example, this, uh, this is a controversial speaker, we might have people outdoors that are uh, geo-fenced into an area. And uh, if we're monitoring that crowd and the ambient temperature gets too high, act on it uh, to identify heat stroke risk. Then lastly, our kind of CCTV and video analytics focused um, sensor feeds, either with an actual video feed annotated, just an annotation, both, or a simulation of the two. Uh, event space occupancy counts. So uh, indoor, real time, uh, ingress and egress point monitoring. So emergency exits, either uh, an event based or a real time count of who has gone in, who has gone out of those spaces. Um, external protest monitoring, so not the ambient temperature, but a crowd count, say for the same crowd we were just discussing. 
And um, if they leave that geofenced area, uh, so an alert type of thing, your crowd is um, leaving its designated area. Uh, object identification, for example, uh, the presence of a backpack on an individual. And uh, lastly, kind of first responder status detection. So in addition to the wearables, uh, the uh, UWB tag that a first responder might wear, which at centimeter level accuracy, you might be able to tell if they're prone, we will use CCTV video analytics to show changes in the status of uh, an expected first responder. So if they go prone, the CCTV video analytics might also indicate to you that status. Lastly, um, kind of a visual learner. So this is the holistic representation, uh, kind of a sample template of how all those sensors might interact. So you can see the uh, floor space of the interior areas, the outdoor areas with the red protesters and the geolocated buffer zone. So some of the sensors and might they might where they be located um, and the dots there, green and blue, representing audience members, first responders being green. So they might interact with each other based off of events. Uh, as the disturbance occurs, hopefully the audience member uh, characters there move away from it. Maybe the first responders move to it. And uh, maybe somebody who's close to the disturbance is injured, those types of things. How all of these sensors play out holistically in a 10 minute feed and interact with each other. Um, so just a kind of visual aid that I thought always brought the whole story together for me. Thanks. Awesome. So let's move on to what a lot of people are been waiting for. And let's discuss some of the cash prizes and the phases of the challenge. And so we'll be talking through the prizes to be won for this challenge through each of the four phases. To see the full list of prizes and the full details, please visit the challenge rules document on the challenge.gov website. So this challenge here offers a total of $1 million US in prizes to be awarded. And so phase one, which has already begun as of June 6, 2022, will run through to July 31st, 2022 at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Phase one will award invitations to phase 2A and 2B, as well as up to 15 prizes of $5,000 for technology development and up to eight best in class awards up to $2,500 each for areas such as virtual reality, augmented reality, phone and tablet applications, and more. Phase 2A starts on August 17th with a submission deadline of September 7th, 2022 at 5 p.m. Eastern time. And phase 2A will award up to 15 awards of $5,000 each for public safety partner collaboration. Phase 2B starts at the same time as phase 2A with a submission deadline of October 23rd, 2022 at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Phase 2B will award up to eight advancing competitors worth invitations to uh, phase three, as well as $15,000 US each for technology development, $5,000 each to cover travel costs to phase three, and a sensor package value at $3,000 uh, and an additional $5,000 to support public safety collaboration. Phase three begins on November 9th, 2022, with the live event occurring between January 9th and 9th, uh, 13th in 2023. For the phase three lab assessments, up to four winners will be awarded invitations to phase four, as well as a chance to win uh, $100,000 for first place, $75,000 for second place, $50,000 for third place, and $25,000 for fourth place, as well as $5,000 US to cover travel costs to phase four. Uh, 5,000 US uh, to support their collaboration with your public safety partner. Fifth and sixth place winners will also be awarded $10,000 uh, each for your achievements. And in the final phase, which starts on January 18th, 2023, with the live event in early March 2023, the technology demonstration will award cash prizes of $75,000 for first place. $50,000 for second place, $25,000 for third place, and $12,500 for fourth place. Additionally, there will be up to four awards of $3,375 to cover their cost to future PSCR stakeholder meetings. So along with that, there will be at least 12 best in-class awards valued at $10,000 each in categories such as VR, AR, phone or tablet applications, web-based, and more. Again, for the full list of prizes, please visit the challenge rules document on the challenge website. 
Winners here will also receive recognition for achievement through press, websites, and webinars. So let's briefly talk about the submission requirements and evaluation criteria just for phase one. So phase one will require contestants to submit a concept paper, images of existing or proposed technology, as well as a prototype capabilities matrix. Uh, a video of existing technologies is optional. In phase one, the evaluation criteria is as follows with a 20% weight on the overview of existing or planned dashboard, 35% weighted for the plans to improve the dashboard's UI UX, and another 35% for, for, for plan or ability to access and display data streams. And lastly, 10% weighted for the quality and the completeness of the submission. So here's how you can participate. And we have simplified this into an infographic for you. So step one will be to create an account on freelance.com. So as we mentioned earlier, you will need an account on Freelancer to be able to submit your entry. So please make sure to create one as soon as possible. Step two, read the full challenge brief. So there's a link on the challenge page where you can actually see the full version of the challenge brief. There's a lot of information for you in that brief. So make sure you read that in full to ensure that you're eligible to participate. Step three, ask questions. So there's a public clarifications board on freelance.com and also an email there for you to ask questions. So please make use of that. Step four is a very important one and that is to register. So there's a link for you in the challenge website. Next, work on your entry after your registration is approved. And then step six, submit your entry by the submission deadline. Now, please do not wait until the very last minute to submit your entry. For one, if you do submit your entry within a reasonable amount of time before the deadline, freelance.com staff can help ensure that your entry is complete. Additionally, you may be required to update your profile on freelance.com before you can submit your entry. So don't leave it to the very last minute uh, or else you won't have time to do that. So get your entries in on time. So next, here's a very quick summary on eligibility. So keep in mind that I am summarizing this and oversimplifying this for this webinar, but please take the time to read this in detail on your own on the challenge brief. So a contestant must register to be able to participate in this challenge. A contestant who registers or submits an entry, whether an individual or private entity or team or anybody acting on behalf of a private entity or team to participate in this challenge represents that they have read, understood, and agreed to all terms and conditions of the official rules. To be eligible to win a cash prize, a contestant must register as an individual private entity or team as defined in the official rules. And once again, full list of eligibility requirements can be found in the official rules. Great, so this brings us to the final portion of this webinar, which is a live Q&A period. And so this is your chance to ask the challenge holders and subject matter experts your questions. So make sure you get those questions into the Q&A panel. If we don't get to your question today, make sure to look out for questions and answers in the challenge uh, website. Okay, so while you're getting your questions into the Q&A panel, we will kick off with a very popular question here regarding participating from a specific country. So can I participate from this country or that question? Uh, that uh, country and the answer here is to double check the challenge rules thoroughly as it really depends on your personal and registration status, uh, but here are a few things to note. Okay? Individuals can be a person that is 18 years old and is a US citizen or permanent resident of the US or its territories. If you are a team, a team can be comprised of two or more individuals or private entities with at least one member of the team meeting the definition for either individual or private entity. If you're a private entity, a private entity can be a company, an institution, or other organization that is incorporated in and maintains a primary place of business in the United States or its territories. Lastly, current or past PSCR challenge participants are also eligible to enter, but you may not use NIST funding for competing in this challenge. How do I register for this challenge? The answer to that is to register. Once again, create an account on France.com, fill in the re uh, registration form, uh, and then the link for you is right there. All right, so let's take some uh, live questions here. So make sure once again to get your questions in. And so we have a question here. Uh, are you looking for wireframe mockups or functional prototypes, Garrick? For phase one, uh, wireframe mockups is just fine. I mean, you feel free to do as much as you want, but wireframe mockups is just fine for phase one. Awesome, thank you. And we have a question here regarding participation and eligibility. So can we participate in an official capacity on behalf of a public safety agency if the agency approves and whether they also count as a public safety partner? 
Sarah Scott, you want to take that question, Sarah? Sarah, I think you're on mute. Great, thank you um, for your question. If you are just one individual participating as, as behalf of the public safety agency, we would still want to see that you're working with other kind of members of your, your team. Um, however, if you're a full team participating in your official capacity, uh, then that would also count as the public safety partner. Perfect, thank you. And we've got another question here. I'm currently registered as an individual. Can I change my registration to team? And if so, how do I do that? Anna, do you wanna answer? Yes, thanks, David. Um, so if you are currently registered as an individual, you can simply resubmit a new registration uh, and indicate yourself as team. And if you can also send a message to the challenge team at nist.freelancer.com, that would also help us keep track of the change. Perfect, thank you. Any last questions? Got another question here. Does France or other entities claim any IP of the work done in this competition? Sarah, go ahead. Great question. Um, it, the intellectual property components is really covered in detail in the official rules. So do really encourage you to kind of review the terms and conditions of the official rules. But no, uh, neither NIST or um, freelancer.com takes any intellectual property. Uh, NIST does, as a government entity, request a demonstration license just to visually be able to describe and share about your, your solution, um, but we take no intellectual property claims. We're really excited about the contestants maintaining their right to the property so they can help advance and commercialize uh, more quickly than we might be able to. But great question. Perfect. So last chance for a live question here. If not, if you think of a question later, once again, you can put the questions in the public clarifications board, uh, or you can write to the email. I've got a question here for the prototype capabilities matrix table. Do we just use X to indicate the current capabilities? Garrick or Sarah, do you want to take that one? Be Sarah? happy to. Um, so you'll actually see there's some uh, pre-built field, uh, fields into the capability Excel table. Um, so very easy and simple. Once you download it, you can be able to see um, how you indicate which you have current uh, capabilities or which you're in progress of. A great question. We're really excited to help uh, contestants kind of track their, their progress throughout the challenge. Perfect. We've got another question here. Will the live demonstration be tailored to our use case or do we have to keep our dashboard solution very general to accommodate other circumstances? For example, my solution may be related uh, to security specifically at a baseball stadium. Garrick, do you want to answer to that? Yeah, one second. It's generally going to have to keep it uh, broad in that your, well, your specific scenario tailored to a baseball stadium it won't be tailored to a day's possible stadium. So you'll have to use the same data sets that the other folks use, other teams, which would be quote unquote general. Perfect. And will there be any need to test or evaluate the technology? So if so, will NIST provide first responders and will IRB be required? Sarah, do you want to take that one? Absolutely. So great question. Um, we detail kind of the test and the evaluation uh, criteria at each phase. And so, yes, NIST will be taking care of kind of any of the, the requirements necessary to fully evaluate uh, the technology. But please review, review the official rules at each phase. And we also provide the evaluation criteria the judging panel will use to evaluate the technology at each phase. Perfect, so we're just coming up to the top of the hour and reminder that if you joined a little bit late, uh, there, this call is being recorded and so it will be uploaded and it will be shared. So if you miss any portion of it, no worries, just watch the recording back. Any last questions for our panelists here today? If not, once again, you can ask your questions in freeanswer.com or through the email. And so with that, we're actually gonna close things out uh, so thank you everybody for joining and thank you to the NIST team uh, and to the LMI team and to the free answer team. Thanks guys. Good luck.